Okay. Um, so tonight, <clears throat> I want to start with a few things before we get into the instruction part at the end here, but uh, just a few things. The first thing is is really off-season training. Uh, you know, we really have, for the most part, we have two types of training. You have, you know, you have your in-season training, and then you have your, your off-season training, and you can even, you can break it down even more than that. Um, as, as far as, if, you know, if you're, you know, a high-level athlete, they'll break it down in certain periods to peak at certain levels and all that stuff. But in general, really, you just have, you know, your kind of the, uh, your off-season, and then you build up in the spring, and then you kind of peak out hopefully coming into the end of spring and then you, you level off and keep it there um, for the year, maybe get a little bit better. Obviously, everybody wants to get a little bit better, but in reality, that would be kind of a perfect scenario. Um, and the way the pros do it is typically for the four majors, you know, high level, you know, uh, professional will be trying to peak for the masters, obviously, and then they'll, they'll take a little break after that. Uh, and then they'll try to peak again for the the uh, the U.S. Open and the British, and then they'll drop. They'll try to level off, take a little time, and then they'll come right back in and try to peak their games up for the for the PGA. Um, for amateurs, it's really like I said. You know, it's just winter time can be. It can be. It's an opportunity, in my opinion. It's an opportunity to really uh, make your entire game better not just you know physically from a swing standpoint but from you know the mental and and, and, uh, and the, fit, the fitness side of it things that are limiting you uh, you know it's kind of like you're starting with a you know with a with a new hand here I mean the winter comes around whether you had a great year or a bad year you're gonna have to you're gonna have an off season so uh, this is a, a my opinion an opportunity for you and if you've had a great year you just keep it rolling, you know, and have another strong off-season training, and then um, and, and we'll go from there. But um, So if you will, just hang on to uh, the chat for a little bit right now, um, and then the, if you will, just kind of mute your mics until I finish up, and then, then I'll answer. I'll definitely answer all those here in just a little bit. We'll answer the chats, and then uh, obviously to open it up for the questions and answers. Um, <clears throat> so... The off season, as we talked about, that's an opportunity. And so, what should you do in the off season? How should you train? Um, the, you, you know, you really, when you start in our program, whether you start mid season, uh, in season, um, you know, we're going to want you to, you know, take your iPad out or a device similar to that, and reverse the camera, angle it up like we talk about, record your swings. You know, you should record your training, and then you should record your swings where you're at. You know your training sessions at the range and you should also also train uh, get some video of yourself on the golf course and um, you know you re how much you do that I mean it's it's hard to tell anybody how much somebody needs to really do something but I will say this you should you, you have to do it enough until uh, feel and real meet each other and if you don't um, then you're like a good example of that Somebody, what somebody feels, and most people on here understand what I'm talking about, but what feeling real for most players, or it's not even, most amateurs, I should say, not even close. I had a four handicap. It's a good player. Um, he may be on here tonight, but his feeling is real. Uh, he's at a lesson the other day, and he was demonstrating a training drill, and it's like it wasn't even close to like how his natural golf swing looks. And they, and so. There, I could tell that any so no matter how much he trains, he's really not going to get a whole lot out of it because they're not even close to being the same. And I actually asked him to make his training swing. His actually tra his golf swing was better than his training swing. I actually had him make his training swing, try to get more like his golf swing. So there's more. It's more reality based because you know the, the changes in the way he's trying to change his movements in his training swing. Uh, was in my opinion useless because it's not from where he comes from in his real swing. You know, in his swing he's really hypermobile, and so and uh, so what I mean by hypermobile means he says has kind of like a bubble Watson type of swing, but that's who he is and that's how he plays golf. And then he was doing training drills that were looked like you know Steve Stricker, but even more restricted, uh, very tight and just not who he was. And and so you have to look and and if he was videoing himself. He doesn't do. He hasn't really videoed himself a lot, so he because he takes lessons with me individually, but he should. And that's what I told him. I said, "Look, you got to see that. I mean, if you saw that in training, you're not going to want to 
not going to want to play like that, obviously. Uh, same thing for everybody on here. The one I think you have an advantage of being online, um, I think, uh, and I was talking about this earlier before we got started, but Jim and I were just talking to us. I, you know, I really believe you have an advantage over a player, and I've told this story to several players, uh, that especially the new guys that are signing up, that you know, I believe there's a, a, a big advantage um, if, that an online player has versus even a guy that's coming to train with us on at the range and so forth. If you give, if we gave a player six, seven lessons, and over course of let's say two months, and then you you let that player out for six months, <clears throat> and then you had an online program program player that we had in here that we that that just followed the program for eight months. The, the player that's online, if everything's equal, equal playing ground, the player that's in the online program will be better. There's just no doubt. We have the data now actually to prove it. Um, and it, it doesn't really actually speak real well for us as teachers, but what I will say this is, is, is teachers will get the player better faster. We'll get them to where their goal is faster, much faster. But the way our program is designed on the online, it's for you to teach you. It's for you to find out who you are and what you're doing wrong and then you to correct it and then to, to build and grow. Because if you rely on somebody else, I mean, a lot of times, I don't want to go too far into this, but I can tell you, like, when we're watching even a Dustin Johnson, he works with Butch Harmon. But Dustin Johnson was, you know, I realized Dustin Johnson was Dustin Johnson before he ever even heard of Butch Harmon. I mean, this guy was a freak athlete that could play. Um, and the same goes, so when you see coaches working with these high-level athletes, uh, you know, it's like me when I work, when I've, I've had been fortunate enough to work with a couple of those, and when you do, it, you know, they're great before they ever met you. You know, so it's easy to inflate the ego by watching them hit and think, oh, yeah, I did this. Well, you didn't do, we didn't do anything. These guys are that way because of them. What coaches will do is they take them just a little bit better, just a little bit better. Not a lot, just a little bit. And a little bit for them is major championship golf or for him, that and so forth. For for an amateur, you have to get a lot better. You know, it's not the same thing. You can't just do a couple of little bitty things here and give them some encouragement and expect them to take off. This doesn't work like that. And the worse you, the, the further you are from the source, the source being the center, which is par for us, uh, so if you're a 20 handicap, the more you got to grind, you know, um, and and, uh, and learn, I should say. I don't know if it's a grind; it's golf. So, but um, so that that kind of helps you. I hope hopefully gives you an idea of how we want you to train. As far as you know, t it's an opportunity over the winter. You have to video yourself. You use your iPad. Reverse uh, reverse the camera. Train live. Train and record. Study yourself. Use the videos on the site as a hub kind of like an encyclopedia and start from one and keep working back through and, and, and studying until you until you find it find yourself and and find your awareness because feeling real at the end of the day need to meet up together and be exactly the same so when you hit a shot on a golf course you're not feeling something that's not there and you'd be surprised at how many players do that professional golfers that I work with and, and I, that I've talked to that, that I don't work with they're feeling real. It's very close. You know, they know like if their right hand passes and they hit a flip left or they spin out of it or whatever. They're 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 right on call. And so when they go to train, they know to train a certain movement that that really try to tries to counter that. So they don't ever do it in competition. Whereas a, an amateur's training in the gym or they're training with the air swings and they're they're making their swing either totally opposite, which is not normally usually they're making the same movement. They're just ingraining it and gets worse, worse, and worse. So you have to video it, use the site, and um, and just let it be your guide. And then you got to listen to yourself. And if it's not, I will give you a tip on that when you're training. Is um, if you're not seeing it change, and, and you're gonna like Jim and I were talking earlier on here. It's like the the best thing you can do if you're not seeing it change, you're gonna have to exaggerate the movement that you need to make more. Uh, and it sounds like that's common sense. Well, it's not because I mean I, I mean, I've watched players, you know, really struggle. They'll try to go out every day. I'm going to do this. I'm going to what? Let's just they're over the plane on the downswing or whatever it is, and they're going to try to side bend or whatever to get the club where it needs to be. Um, and they do it, and it doesn't doesn't change an inch, doesn't change any. And they do it, and they do it seven days in a row, 
Whereas it, all it really takes is one in the same day is if you saw your video, you look at your video, and then you just go and exaggerate the ever living hell out of that. Because however much you're off in a bad movement is going to be however much you have to counter that with to get to the center. It's just like true yin and yang. So you have to, um, if your club's a foot under the plane, you're going to have to feel two feet over the plane to get it to the center. You won't be able to feel one foot. It's not going to be enough. It won't change enough. And it, it could be with anything, grip, it could be set up, it could be, it doesn't matter. It's just that your exaggeration when you look and you're training yourself will have to be much, much higher than it would be than if you did like a live training lesson or a session here at a golf school or a lesson, private lesson, whatever. And with anybody actually, you know, because a good coach, I don't care what they teach, they're going to make you exaggerate until they get you where they want you to look for them. And same with us too. I mean, we have a certain way we like players to look when they're swinging as far as flow, and, you know, we'll just pound them until they get it. Um, and that's it. That's probably the biggest difference. So when you're on the – when you're when you're having to do this process, you have an advantage because you're studying yourself every time you, you, you train, but you just got to really think about it and say, how long do I want to just keep doing this the same way? And then you just hit that exaggeration button and just do it really exaggerate it. And then you'll start to see it change. And when you see that change, you're going to gain a lot of confidence. And then that confidence will start to turn into a, a good feel and strength. And then feel and real will start to meet up and look a lot alike. And that's what we got to have. Um, I think, and that's, in, in the playing season, that's tough. You know, we have to let players kind of go and, uh, you can let feel and real be a little off, that's for sure. They don't have to be perfect when you start, and they're not going to be. But in this time of year, this is a great time to just, you know, really, really, if you want to make changes, and I, I don't really like to say swing changes, but movement changes for sure, uh, and motion changes, the fluid parts of it, you know, what we teach, this is the best time to do it. And you don't really have to worry about ball flight playing a whole lot and some some of you that are on here that do have to work that are still playing they're going to play your round like we're playing right now um you still need to make these changes if you're new to the program and exaggerate i mean you don't want to kind of we have a real get one percent better every day um but that's overall you really sometimes have to push that a little harder um in this first in the first few uh, in the first stages to see yourself changing so and you definitely want to see yourself changing. It doesn't need to look exactly the same. <clears throat> Let's see. Covered most of it here. So one thing I, I like to talk about um, as well, and we're close to getting to the, uh, the golf swing stuff, but is use mental uh, Im uh, imagery. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of data, a lot of testing has been done on this. And, um, you, you know, as far as player, you know, where they had a good good ones where they had a survey of, I think it was 10 piano players that, uh, that trained for two weeks that actually did the training and the techniques and so forth. And then, then they, uh, there was another group that was taught the techniques the first day and then they only could use mental imagery. And uh, in two weeks, they really all were about the same, even though there was a group that had, um, you know, that had really uh, been trained physically. And the other one had been just doing mental training. And they ended up in two weeks relatively the same. Uh, in, in reality, like the Tesco, that's a two-week process, a big difference. You can't really do that the whole time. But you can certainly add that into your arsenal to, to – uh, you should see the bad motion. The way I like to do mental Im imagery is to see what your reality is. So if you look at your swing and it's going to look unique and there's going to be weaknesses that will stand out like a sore thumb, and there's going to be strengths in there. And you, you really should only focus on the uh, the weaknesses in the first stages in training, and then when you when you when you study that, um, you just you need to know what that looks like, and so you have that image in your head, and then you see yourself doing it both ways. You might spend five minutes where you just see yourself making these movements, or, or I wouldn't say five minutes. I'd say probably a minute to two minutes to seeing the the incorrect motion that you're currently making, and then seeing the the correct motion same part person same body everything but seeing the corrective motion and I really believe that that has helped a lot of the players that I've coached not only hands-on but it's uh, some of the ones that have worked one-on-one -on -one with me live that that know that I'm, I'm really big on painting pictures in your head uh, not just on the golf course but it, your motion the way you want it to look for you 
And I think that's uh, because if you understand the wrong, if you understand your your weaknesses, then you un you should understand the corrections. It doesn't mean you can do them. And I'm not saying that, but it, it, I, I'm not saying you can't do it right now. I'm just saying that if you know your your uh, weakness then you're going to be able to picture the way you know it should look. And that's what you should focus on when you're in training mode. It, and, you know, it's a good time to do it. What I typically do with mental training um, is usually right before bed because it's kind of in the same classification as meditation, so it kind of quiets the mind. Gets, if you have a long day at work, or uh, I know we have some kids on here, they don't really deal with that at school, and a lot of pressures that are on, on you. Every stress is stress. It's just a matter of what kind you're dealing with individually. but it'll help uh, kind of calm the nervous system and get you to not think about all those things and so, kind of settle the monkey mind and get your get your mind on something that's fun which is golf and kind of seeing yourself doing something and performing you know really at the highest level and so um, that'd be really about it on that um, but I do like to see that you know spend a little time seeing the incorrect movement I think that's very important to understand what reality is now and seeing yourself changing that and that being the model the way you want to move and then I, I, I believe that if the training and the mental are working together I just I'm a big believer that they start to marry up with each other so um, though so tonight we'll get on with uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it tonight uh, I'm going to keep it really more for questions and answers um, but I, I am going to spend a little bit of time talking about rooting and and it's really hard to talk about in this format. I'm going to do the best that I can, but then the video, the follow-up video, I think you'll you, you you'll receive. You'll get uh, all the explanations, and uh, I'll do my best to show you um, how to root. Now, what is rooting? And so rooting, where I came up with the word, I didn't come up with the word, first of all. I learned it in Tai Chi. And rooting is where if you just stand up, anatomically stand up straight, and you know you have your you know shoulders wide, the lower part of your back is flat, your pelvis is, is slightly forward, but your knees and your knees are slightly bent. Um, your, your, your top of your spine is erect. And some of you guys have hopefully been to the injury prevention um, page. I just put it up, but that'll teach a neutral posture. And it's very hard to talk about because I, there's no, I don't have any pictures on here to show you, but they are the, there's a plenty of pictures and then also videos on neutral posture. And anytime you um, are playing any sport or lifting or, or uh, like I said, stretching, doing any of this stuff, if you don't know what neutral posture is, you got a really good chance of blowing your back out because most people don't have this, have neutral posture without being taught that. And so uh, neutral posture can, uh, is your spine, but then you also have joint alignments, and that's, uh, that's kind of another thing. So, but, but when, you, when you're uh, dealing with rooting in the golf swing, I'm going to show you down the line um, a picture here and a video, and, and then I'm going to show you a face on and show you how it works. Down the line, it looks like this right here. So let me get, the, let me get this up. So the way he angles his body, and every player angles their body a little different on tour. But this is a really good way, whether you're tall or short, it's a really good model and you can see just by the way he angles himself he's not angled straight down to the ball with his with his chest here he's angled out in front of him just like that so the weights on the balls of his feet here but he's also rooted from here so he's not got weight on his heels but his, his butt's in a position where uh, and his spine's flat in this area where he can move really athletically through his toes so he's because you know so um, to help you understand uh, rooting with the feet. If, if somebody, if you took your, um, if you took your uh, toes off the ground, all right. So if you're standing straight up and you took your toes off the ground, you tried to jump as high as you could, you wouldn't get very high because it's you're jumping off the weakest part of your foot. The most, the power, what really puts pressure against the ground. And if you took your heels off the ground, you jump. Well, you'd be able to jump your normal height, or you know, that'd be your highest and your strongest jumping position. Well, it's the same in the golf swing. So. You don't want to root into your heels. That's the weakest part of your foot as far as being able to apply pressure. All right? And so and, and it, it gets overlooked. So And when you get up here on your toes, what most people do is they really flex their knees, over flex their knees here. You really don't even need near as much as he has here. You, he, could do with, he could do less flex here. 
but the way you angle your body will will um, it will make your feet root and that's hard to understand but your feet kind of tell you the whole story so when somebody like I'll typically have them in posture like like him right here and then I'll go over here if they're at a, in a golf lesson with us I'll push them from the side I'll push them back that way to tell or I'll, we call it the four points I'll push them from the front the back and the side and the side and I can't tell you uh, how many players it's every single one of them that's an amateur that when I push on them they're not rooted so and what that means is it means that they don't have neutral posture here it's not the feet aren't really the problem the feet are just kind of like the computer they're telling you this is here, here's the pro, here's what's going on you they can't they can't root the feet because of the way they they got their body um, inclined and so if he's pelvis if you look at his pelvis here we'll start with it you can see this is the angle that his pelvis is on if his angle of pelvis it's actually a little lower than that it's a little more tilt than that if his pelvis was horizontal which is like just about everybody we see they usually have a lot of knee, a lot more knee flex than he has here and then they have a pelvis where the, if you picture his butt here, the belt there, and the and the top part of the belt, they would be equally in line. You can see the his belt buckle is lower, so he's tilted forward. And you don't you can see he's not really tilted much with his upper body. He's bent a little bit, but he's not really bent much because he because the more he bends forward, he's going to lose the root out over his toes. So he's going I could push him forward, and he would lose his root. So he stands up tall here. He's got his hips pointed at an angle. He's got his hips pointed at an angle right here. He's got he's tall through the chest, so that allows him to rotate through his thoracic part of the spine, which is which is right here. So he's going to be able to rotate through this area, which is where you know the shoulder and the chest mobility come from. Through they go through that area. So if you have a if you're tight in this area, you're not going to be able to rotate through there. All right. Or you go you can rotate through there. It'll just be compensated, and it won't your feet won't be rooted. And there's really an art to that. So right now, the way he's set up, because of the way his pelvis is and the way he's got resistance from the backside, his feet right here are just, are, they're straight down into the ground. So that big toe and the second toe that we always talk about, they're, they're pushing straight down into the ground. But that again is just an effect. That's just an effect of the way he's got his body angled. And it doesn't take, when so, so, and when you look at Dustin Johnson, everybody's going to go, I know what everybody's going to say. They're going to say, well, it's Dustin Johnson. Yeah, well, I mean, well, I don't, I'm, I'm 60 years old plus, and I can't move like him. No, I, I agree, you can't move like him, but I can guarantee you, you can get in the same posture. That posture that he's in is very, very easy to do. It just is actually, truthfully, it's very technical. And he probably actually was taught this. He probably was pretty close to that uh, when he was growing up. But... A lot of to be that good at it, somebody, a professional, and it, you, it's usually not a coach, it's usually a physical therapist that will work with them and show them what neutral posture is. And so that'll allow him to rotate more, the most efficient through his shoulders, chest, and his thoracic part of his spine. Also, by keeping really good stability through his lower body. Because, see, your lower body can rotate like crazy. Like, if you watch his swing, I'm going to take it all the way back. Watch how much his lower body, and I want you to watch his back leg because that's his part of the root. So when we go back, a lot of people would go, look, it, look, this right here, the, his, his knee is, his, um, is too straight. It's one, his knee's not straight. What happens is, so his knee's fairly straight, but it's not completely locked. And it could be even locked, and he can still keep the root in this entire leg. So even if you pushed on him right here at any point, all four points, he's not, I'm telling you, he's not moving an inch. Um, but what happens is this this hip right here, both hips, there's a ball socket joint that the hip fits in. That gets when that gets stacked, what we call stacked, that hip is in its stacked position right there. If he had his knee really flexed, like say his knee was like here, which is what is really I hell I used to teach a long time ago, I didn't know any better. Flex your knee, your back leg and your back swing, that's just, that doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't allow the hip to get into its socket. And so you can't root through the toe, uh, and the big toe and the second toe nearly as efficient as you can is if it's actually straighter. And so um, he's taking it. He's 
I mean, it's tip turn here. I mean, I'm not measuring, but I'm telling you that's 50 plus degrees. And it's a lot. It's a lot more than most of the people would see. So he's turning a lot through his lower body. But what's important to note is he didn't, as he turned, he didn't give up this angle. Okay, and so that angle that he has in his hips is what's allowing him to um, keep the root into both of his feet. And the root changes, the root rotates. It's just like if you can picture, um, and I know it's this complicated, but it'll make more sense once I, once I show you the video. But the root, so it's rotated. So it's like if you could picture this being a screw and then you took a wrench and you just rotated it, that's what it is, but it stays in the ball of the foot and on the inside portion of the foot. It can go a little to the outside, but it's in that ball region. It's really not back here. This is just the stability part. All the pressure is up in this area, so when he goes, you'll see as he goes to move, he'll move through the strongest part of his foot. He's not going to move through the heel. Right there, you can see, that's, the, that's where he's applying pressure in both feet, not just his right toe. So, but when he loads, he stacks that joint so if you pushed him in his hip right here, it would feel like he's pushing you back. And that's what rooted is. And so in Tai Chi, where I got this from is like, you know, you work with somebody that's a high level and, you know, a, a master of Tai Chi, and they can be standing in anatomical alignment, and you push them, and they don't move. And it's not any of this mystical fake stuff. I mean, I'm telling you, they feels like they're pushing you back. And it's not like we're seeing some of the fake videos where you see them where they can, you know, they push their hands at you and you drop, they drop back 10 feet or any of that silly stuff. But I'm talking about when you push on them, they're pushing back. And there's a secret to it. It's not luck. It's training. And because I can do it now. And if I can do it, anybody. Because when I first did it, I had no, I had no idea. And it's how you torque your feet. And it's it, part of it. It's how you get your spine in neutral alignment. And when you get those two things in neutral alignment and you learn how to torque your feet in the Wuji stance, what happens is your body becomes locked to the ground. I mean, you just are. And you can do some, uh, put it this way, if you're a vet man, you can make a lot of money by demonstrating this with people because you, you think that they can just push you down or somebody that's a lot bigger and they really can. I'm not saying it's like martial arts where they can't pick you up and take you down. I'm talking about if they're pushing you on your chest against you, same height, and not doing, trying to do any kind of other takedowns or anything like that, you can, you're going to be be able to just stand in natural alignment with soft relaxed shoulders and they ain't going to be able to move an inch and it's it's more of a you have to see it to believe it but actually more than that you have to actually be able to do it to really believe it and I can teach you how to do that um, and that's part of that is on the uh, on the online program on the injury prevention program talking about just neutral posture once you learn neutral posture there's some stances I can teach you in the in the Tai Chi as we go along to how to torque the feet and that'll be really essential for you but you have to remember the feet are telling you the whole story and so if you're not rooted in your natural alignment your natural neutral posture just standing vertically you're probably not going to be rooted when you're bent because as soon as you start to bend so if he's at address here I'm going to take him back to address so if he's just standing you can picture his head being uh, vertical to his hips here just like this it, so when he starts to move this way, that changes it again. Because the way you bend, your, your joint alignments from your hips and your shoulders, your chest, your core, your knees, they all play a part of this rooting. If your knees are, you know, if you shift your pelvis really back, so if he put his butt really back and he straightened his knees, all of his weight would be in his heels. If he flexes his knees really forward, collapses his pelvis, kind of in a circle this way, like he rolls it under this way, which is very common, and he flexes his knees, his weight's going to be in his heels again. There's a million different ways. He could, he could have, one other thing you can do when you're looking at posture, you can have your knees straight and then really bent over, which is the worst position. So you're back like this. So your chest is really down, so you have way too much weight on your toes and way too much weight on your heels. That's, that's actually pretty popular with, with amateur golf. And that all is going to affect your 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 quality of your rotation. Um, you you can compensate around it in your downswing, but there has to be a compensation. And most of the time, amateurs don't compensate. They just move in like they move one two. They don't move like one adjust and then number two. That's what pros do. And so it's very important to understand, in my opinion, 
how to root your feet, but you root it through your how you get your body inclined. And it doesn't, you don't have to be a high level athlete to do it. You just have to know what neutral is. It's just like if somebody tells you, you know, to turn on the lights in your house and you don't know what a light switch is, you're probably going to have a hard time doing it. Well, and that's what we try to teach you here is to how to find that. Because it really is not that hard. You do have to train for it and understand it. And then your understanding will come from whenever you start to do it. Um, so that's when, and that's when, that's when confidence will take over and then you'll be on your way. So I'm going to show you a face on here. Um, let me get same, same thing here, driver. So, so the, I'm going to show you the route changes and you just have to bear with me on here because some of this, you know, even this format is, it's, it's tricky to show you exactly how it all works, but I'm going to do my best. So as you can see, when he sets up the root is in the big toe, second, uh, uh, the big toe and the, uh, the second toe there and it's straight down. So the root when you start with the feet would be if you have your body inclined correctly and you're balanced with your knees, your hips, and your shoulders, it would be this way. It should not be angled one way or the other. It should be just straight right here. Now when he turns back, the root's going to change because of, you know, because of rotation. And so the left, the and, and this is really important for anybody that's a short hitter on here, um, take note is all I can tell you. So this but this uh, big toe and second toe, the angle of pressure is would be what it's actually better from the knee. The knee would be on an angle towards the golf ball, behind the golf ball. Excuse me, on this angle. So the pressure, and if you get that, the ang that knee kind of behind and but out actually towards the golf ball. That means the root would be pressing somewhere in this area, the root of the foot. That's the torque. Because remember, it started in the center. So then if you get the if you get the back leg like you saw him do fairly straight, then what happens is this this root is down, but then it's it's slightly rotated. Which I'll show you. It's slightly rotated. It's like if you took a you know, if you took a a uh, put a screw there and then you just rotated it with the wrench there. Let me erase this. So the angle that your knee and your pelvis, the knee especially on this, but the lead knee will be that angle. And you'll feel this tremendous amount of pressure on the inside portion of this foot and the big toe and the second toe. That's a root, so that means you have, some, if, you, if it's rooted, you have something, it means it's torque. So you have something to torque back against, you have to pull from. You can't pull something you don't have. So what, will typically happen is if his head, let's just say, and he doesn't do it, but let's just say his head went this went this way in his backswing, went way left. Most of the time it actually goes the other way with Anders. We'll stay here. He could root this left leg, but he couldn't root this right leg because of mechanically of how he's got his body. And you know, he turns, so when you look, you see him rotate his neck, but if you look at the structure of his head, the way he's set up, it's right where he's, that's exactly where he's set up. He didn't move it an inch. The chin turned, he really didn't chin, but his neck rotation, the cervical part, turned turned with it. But the actual center where he started his head, like the left side of his face, is right there. So a lot of people see this, oh, he's behind the ball. No, that's just cervical neck rotation. That's just rotation. Different part of the spine that he's rotating through. It's very important to know, because if you drift your head this way, way off in your backswing, and you go, let's say you move two feet off the ball, then then what's going to happen is you won't have any root at all in this left leg. You can probably, if you don't move too far, you can still root in the right, but you're going to lose the root in the left. And so it, that's really, really, really important to know. You should have a root in your feet at all times. From the, from the start of the setup, he's, he's rooted here, he turns against that root, he sinks into the root, he turns back and moves forward against the root again, and he's rooted with both feet right there. He's pressed against the ground right here on the inside portion, the big toe and second toe, and this is pressed up forward here onto the big toe and the second toe. So if you pushed on him right here, it's the same thing. He still has that structure. As he's hit the ball and he goes through, he's going to start to lose some of the root. And he, he doesn't really lose it with the lead leg, but he'll lose it with, with this. You don't have to have it. Once you've got through in this area, 
you need to be solid as a rock with your core and your the body parts that need to be stable, which is you know the the the, the glutes and the core, all those muscles and the feet should be planted, like because that's what they're designed to do, and the arm should be uh, just moving forward, and that's what will happen. So it's really important. So he he's got a he's got a uh, a swing here that. And you don't have to have all this rotation that he has to be able to do this, but you do need to have both feet rooted at, at both times. That's why it's one of the reasons why he kills the ball. He's got tremendous thoracic mobility, all right? And there's a lot of videos on the website on our workout injury prevention. Part. Well, it's actually on the workout part telling you how to do the exercises. But, uh, you know, and watch the ones that we have. So the videos that I put up about in our workout program, they're not just kind of like I throw some together and, then we just kind of put it together to have it. We, there are specific videos that I've trained personally and used with clients that that I've found to be better than others. I would not like do this, like start Googling like how to do golf fitness. That, that is, that, you know, that that won't work. Uh, there's very few workouts that actually do work. Kettlebells, body weight training are phenomenal, and in specific areas, thoracic. If you just fix, and the guys, the players that have been on here with me for a while, they've heard this a thousand times. You got to get full thoracic mobility. You can't be too good in that area. You got to have lower core strength. So you got to have thoracic mobility here. You got to have lower core strength, and you got to have butt strength, glute strength. Same thing. That's what you're trying to develop as a golfer. You don't have to have big arms. You know, you don't have to have big shoulders. And the bigger your arms are, the more that stuff gets in your way. And that's why you see even Dustin Johnson. You know, he's he's a he's a great athlete but his arms aren't huge you know he's not a he's not a monster as far as his arm size he he can use his arms because of his body look at justin thomas his arms are you know size of my thumb but he hits it a mile it, it, and so you have to be real careful with how you train and uh and very specific if i just said if somebody said well i just want you know three things i would tell them you, you can do them every day lower core thoracic mobility so lower core strength, thoracic mobility, and glute strength, and do them every day. And I guarantee you, your game will get better every single day. And you don't have to have a thousand exercises. You just do, do three or four, and just just do them every day. And, and and you have to get a little, you know, it doesn't come free. You know, it's just going to take. You're going to have to put some sweat into it. You know, the, the the mobility and the strength issues won't come free. So. All right, so let's start over here, and then we'll kind of open it up for questions. Yeah, exactly. Jim said 1% better. That's the truth. You just get 1% better every day with your fitness, and I'm telling you. If you get, you just have to be specific. And the reason why I say this, and I don't want to harp on it all night here because I have a tendency to do that, but is, I, you know, obviously I have a passion for this stuff. And I, when, I, when I got into fitness, I didn't kind of get into fitness when I, when, when I did it. I got all the way in, and I tried everything. I went you know, for two hour hot yoga sessions to CrossFit to you name it, I did it. I broke it down and when I did it, I didn't just do it and say, oh yeah, this makes my golf swing better and, and go out and hit ball. I tested it the same day. I tested every single workout I ever did, I tested the same day or the next day. And I wanted to see results. And to, so I could say, all right, this works, this doesn't work. And that's really what I did. And you'd be surprised at how many things actually don't work. And you'd be also surprised at how many really high-level players I talked to that quit working out because of they were getting worse. And it's because of you can't you, if all you're working is on upper body strength, you're doing lots of push-ups, you're doing lots of dips, you're doing lots of pull-ups. Good luck. You know you're probably going to suffer. You're going to look good, but your your golf game's going to suffer. Uh, if you open your body up. And you find your true weaknesses, and then you open, you get those three specific areas that I had. If you just get the three specific areas that I talked about, there's no doubt you're going to be better. And it doesn't re really require, you know, hardcore training. It just requires, you know, spending, you know, five to to five minutes to an hour. Uh, five minutes a little short, probably ten minutes to to an hour uh, when you have time. So. Um, just remember on the rooting, <clears throat> I'll make the video, it, it, it should be, it, the rooting would be straight down on both feet when you start. That rooting is going to change because your right side's rotating, your back side should say, we have some lefties on here, but your back side's rotating against that root and against that angle that's, that's pointing downward. You can still even see here, 
if he was his body is pointing this way, pointing down, um, not all the way to the ball, but it's pointing where we showed earlier out in front of the ball, and that's where his angle of rotation is, and it's over the tops of his feet. So when he gets here, then he can pull back. You have to realize, you know, that circle we talk about, and I'll show you from the down line because it makes it makes a lot of sense when you see it, but. If you can look at my cursor, it's going to go like this. It's going to go in a circle this way, and this one's going to go in a circle this way. And that's, and that's where that, that sink and circle comes from. So, but you can't really do that if you don't get the torque against both feet. But you, now you can see he's working in that circle that we talked about, and then it just goes forward. And I'm going to show you one more from, let's see if I can go down the line here one more time. You will be amazed when you do this. Um, you, this you'll be amazed when you do If you get your body angles up here, and you don't, I would even tell you less knee flex than this right here. I would tell you to get your body angles just like this on the spine and the hip angle we're talking about. But your feet don't, your knees don't have to be flexed to have your feet rooted. And I'll do, when I do the video, I'm gonna have somebody pushing on me so you can see this. You just have to have, um, but you do have to have the incline when you're bent like that, okay? But you don't even need that much flex. And you'll see he loses all that right knee flex anyway. And the left knee uh, flexes, you'll see it. I mean, it flexes that direction. So the root in the foot is the same way. It's that direction right here. So that one, this root's working totally different than this, than this root here. So that's really heavy here on the inside and, and on the toe and the, and the big the big toe and the second toe and then this one is it it's still straight down but it's also it's like if you again if you took that wrench and turned it about a, about a half it's rooted there if he wasn't rooted here with all that thoracic mobility if that wasn't rooted here one he would he'd probably fall down on the ground over here to the back behind him because it would be so much into the heel now, if you got all the way in the heel, you can still get to the toe. I mean, he's still got some pressure. His heels is, is, is grounded there, but the pressure, I'm telling you, is right on that toe because he's, he's got it on this one. He's got it here. They're two different, and then that, he'll use that again as he starts his circle for his downswing. He'll use that against the ground. Then you'll see his body start to uh, circle back. Look at his knees. His knee's going to flex. His right knee will flex straight out and then circle and then they all become stacked. So that's a stacked position. If you, if you put your hand on him right here, this is the strongest that he's been so far. He's been rooted in every position, but this right here is by far and away the strongest he is. And this is where he's actually going to do that release we talk about, where he releases the middle and, and the side of the shaft and the ball. Because this is like this is stacked. So then he will, he will just, from there, slam it right into the back of the ball and through. And so, It'll make more sense, just like the videos usually do after uh, you know the next day once I go make them and all that, because it, it, there's a lot of detail to this. It's very technical, especially to talk about. It's it's way harder to talk about than it is for me to demonstrate. I can assure you that. But you, if you understand the technical side of this, especially over the winter, if you can really get a mechanical advantage of being rooted in your swing the entire time. And a lot of what we found is a lot of the players when they hear rooted, it's a cool word. What they'll typically do is they'll squat with their knees a whole lot. And then they'll try to push their butt back, and that's not it. And so um, there, there's a, just a way to do it, to incline your body, get it loaded. And when your body's at a certain angle, your feet will, are, they'll just, they lighten up. They just become, you can feel it. It's very explosive. You feel, you feel, you feel tall and relaxed with your arms, but you feel like your um, feet are just like so into the ground. And then you learn how to turn your spine, especially in your backswing, and then transition right over that root, both roots. And uh, the left knee, um, now, and, and so some of the questions are, like, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, let me just finish up this real quick, but if you, when you turn back over that root, you want to be able to make sure that you just don't lose it, because you can lose the root um, in one foot and still be a great player. You don't have to have it in both feet. So you can lose the root going back, but in your downswing, like when he gets here, you're not going to see a player in the world that's not rooted when they start here. But this is going to be the delivery area. 
And so they're rooted in both feet. Now, I'm going to look different. They're all going to look a little bit different. But they're going to be very, 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 uh, you know, rooted because this is the delivery part. Amateurs will not be rooted. You know, they'll be, their knees will be straight up here. Their pelvis will be shifted forward quite a bit towards the golf ball. And they'll already be casting the club head out. So basically every, you know, uh, every area uh, will be off in that. But when you see a pro, they'll be very, very strong in here. And so I already had a question, so I'm going to open it up to that now. And one of the questions was with, like, with Keegan Bradley, and like he has a lot of knee flex and don't taller players. Well, uh, Johnson, you know, equally as tall. And you can see he doesn't, he could even have less knee flex. But what, like, what, Keegan Bradley really found to do was he got his body to go in two different directions to count to get to the middle, and he went about it. You know, he went about it a typical great player's way without instruction. Nobody taught him how to do that. Uh, what he did, he learned how to squat a whole lot, get his butt back, but then his chest way down. So his chest was his chest was way down here, and his butt's going way back this way. And then he's got a lot of knee flex. And then what ends up happening is he gets he gets his core engaged, he gets his back flat, but he gets the spine flat, but it's really bent, and he hits the middle. And you can do that. It's not the most, there's no way it's the most efficient way. You know, he's still rooted, but it's not the most efficient way to move. And if you watch how he turns, yeah, he keeps flex, but there's a tremendous amount of rotation, and the root still stays in the big toe and the second toe and it's torquing like we're talking about, like it's wrenching. So if you look at this area, even though their knee flex is going to be totally different here, this hip is going to be locked the same, and the angle of this is still going to be the same. And that's what's going to be able to keep him um, there. And you'll also see with Bradley that his knee, this knee, the pressure, it's not so much the knee, it is kind of the knee, I guess. It, you, it, it's going to root that foot the big toe and second toe in a way. Most amateurs, the reason why I'm saying this is because if you're watching this, most of the time the knee with an amateur moves too much this way. Their knee is back here. And if you just try that tonight, try to move your knee, um, you know, really inside. Don't don't move it this way. You'll, you'll see how much power you lose. You can even go, and I don't advocate this, but like J.B. Holmes, he puts his foot or knee straight out. It's actually in front of the golf ball. I don't really agree with doing that, but the thing is, is you when you do it, if you feel it, there's a tremendous amount of root when you do that. The most efficient, so you can work in a better circle and better for your spine and your and your thoracic to rotate it around. Because if you don't, if you just go straight, you're gonna have a harder time moving your thoracic. But when you move this way, and this is again, it's the I'm not saying it's the only way. You just gotta remember that. I'm just saying that this is the most efficient. And you're talking about somebody that. You know, I test everything before I put it out there, personally and with, with students. But this is no doubt the most efficient way. And it doesn't really require you to be a great athlete. You know, the thoracic part does, but this part you just have to understand what it is. And if your hips don't look like that, make them look like that. You know, trust me. You want to get them tilted down. That doesn't mean that you have to, uh, that you, you can see it doesn't have a lot of bend here. The more you got to realize when I get people angled like this, the first thing they want to do is bend their chest way down. When you do that, now you've made the, those muscles uh, in the thoracic part of the spine much harder to rotate around. You, that's, the, Keegan Bradley is so mobile and so flexible. So is Dustin Johnson. They can bend, even Johnson, he could bend down another foot if he wanted to. And so uh, if, he was, if he was turning around that, he could still move. But he, can, he knows that he can move more efficient by having his hips tilted and, it, and taller up here. And he's a tall guy, so a lot of times guys will say, like with the question earlier is like, well, don't tall players have to bend more? And no. I mean, Justin Johnson's very tall, and look how upright he is. He's very, and he could even have less knee flex. He just feels he's, he's very rooted here. But he could still extend his knees more, keep his pelvis the same, extend his knees more, um, kind of back without going into his heels, and he would even be more efficient. He does it anyway. He does it right here. But most people, when you do this, you got to realize that everybody we're talking about, they're rooted. Um, amateurs, every player that I see, they're not, they're not rooted. And so when I'm telling you there's, there's variation in styles, there's certainly one way that I've found to be um, 
most efficient for every player. And it's going to look a little bit different with every player, but you got to realize rooted is rooted. And so if you are um, – Every player from Keegan Bradley, whether it's Adam Scott or it's Roy McIlroy, you're talking about every single player I'm talking about, Justin Rose, they're rooted. I mean, they have this angle. Because you got to remember, it's, it's more about the angle of your body this way than it is anything. So, and I think that's a, uh, I think that's really, 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 really important for everybody. So if I'm saying that really, 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 telling you it's important for you to understand that most players are rotating on an axis like this so they're rotating around a horizontal axis and, the, and they're rotating around this big collapse in the spine they're rotating around this big collapse of the spine but also they're working around this collapse of the neck and so that cuts off massive rotation when you do that so you're going to be playing around you're not going to be rooted one no matter what your knees look like or this um, and you're also not going to be able to to uh, uh, to, to rotate. So you're not in, in I'm not rotation and rooting are not exactly they're not the same thing. But I, in golf, what makes it tricky is you ha when you rotate you every every you have to be rooted in the delivery. So you cannot you don't have to be rooted back here. There's players that don't. Payne Stewart really wasn't. And then when you get here, but when you start to go here to here, when you come out. You're in transition, you come out of transition, you're going to see every player become rooted. Every player. Not kind of some or there's 70 or 97%, 100% will be rooted out of transition. Because that's the delivery. Now some deliver it, um, it would be some deliver it closer into the ball, some do it like Dustin Johnson and what we teach from way back here, which gives you a mechanical advantage if you do that. So but right here, everybody has to. So if you lost your root in your back foot or your front foot or whatever, you have to go get all that here. I'm just teaching you that there's a way to do it where it's, it's just a lot easier. Because again, remember, amateurs don't adjust. So if you're not rooted, um, if you're not turning rooted in your backswing in, a tra in transition, the odds on you being rooted when you come out of transition are not very good. And it's just really, really, really important to know that. Because that's what you're you're, you're 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 trying to deliver the club, you know, within degrees of being perfect through impact, into impact and out of impact. And if you're and if you're root, if your body is not rooted, that means you're trying to deliver something with an unstable surface. It's like having a wrecking ball and moving the base around when the wrecking ball is trying to hit a building. Imagine that; it wouldn't work out very well. And so you have to the delivery, and that's just raw biomechanics. You want your your lower body stability um, to be at, at max whenever you're delivering anything, golf club, hockey stick, whatever it is, striking. And this is how you do it. Um, but you will see different forms. Am pros will do it differently than amateurs for sure. They're always going to be rooted. They're, they'll go about it different ways and looks to get it, but they're always rooted. If you pushed on him. This guy, Keegan Bradley, Roy McIlroy, you know, Roy's another one that if you look at model-wise, I mean, he does it great. Jordan Spieth, unbelievable. So, um, let me look and see. We've got some questions here. My chat's probably not going to open up again. Nope. So, um, I know a lot of questions are on the, the chat here, so if you will, uh, just... I can't get them when you type them in. I get them instantly, and then I can't get to them. So if you will, just whoever, if somebody wants to read them off, some of the questions that we have, just let me know. Matt, uh, one guy asked, and it's Greg. Okay. Um, Which one? Now, can you read that one more time? What helps more with hip depth and impact? Rooted feet or attack of the right shoulder? Okay, so th just remember that rooted feet are they're telling they're telling the story. So you're not really it's not like you're getting over there and you're trying to root your feet because. Um, you're just not trying to really. What happens is you get your body inclined at a certain angle, 
and the feet become rooted. And then it, it's not fa it's not manufactured. It just happens. It has to happen. It's not like you're 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 really gripping the ground and you're uh, manipulating it with just your feet. What happens is you get your body at certain angles. And Mike, I know, I think he just joined us, but Mike can certainly can can vouch for it. When you get your body at certain angles, inclined a certain way, the feet become uh, they become rooted. And the right shoulder has nothing to do with having rooted feet, zero. The right shoulder, the reason why the right shoulder, uh, the video does so well, is it gets guys to, to think moving this way. All right, so it gets guys, because most guys, you got to realize, all right, so when I made that video, I, I know all this stuff. Most guys move in a horizontal fashion, all right? So when you, when you, when a, when a player, first sees that video, they always have success. I mean, I mean, I don't know, not always, but it's a very high percentage. And they, they're moving horizontally this way with their whole body, hips, everything. So they have not rooted at all. And all of a sudden they think, well, shoot, man, I got to get my shoulder all the way down to here. The first thing that happens is they'll start to move differently. It won't, and it's, and again, it's not a whole lot, but it's different. They're moving more inclined down to the ball like a pro would. So it's the first time in their life they ever felt like they got the club in a position to actually deliver it and and uh, with some power and some some accuracy and so um, ultimately it's why you end up here um, but the right shoulder you got to realize the hip depth and right shoulder are not related at all you can move you can have your left hip right in, in, in now he doesn't do it but I'll demonstrate it in the uh, uh, in the uh, video that I do he could push his left pel his pelvis whole pelvis forward here which guys will do that and still try to be working his right shoulder, but the pelvis is in his way. The pelvis will work. That's why we teach that in the float. Like you, when you go back, you slow down. We want depth. Depth is this way, but you got to realize this. Your the depth is that way, but it's rooted down, like we talked about, like a corkscrew in the top of the foot. Most guys will kick the hip back, then they lose the root. But the weight goes straight back here, like that. And then they, they're not athletic enough, and neither is this guy even, to, well, he could probably come out of it. But they can't come back out and root again and then time it up with the square in the club face. It gets really complex, and that's why they don't hit it straight. You know, it's, one, it's a, certainly a, a major reason why they don't, they're not able to hit it straight. Because they, and when they stick the hip out this way, when they try to get hip depth, it's not even the right way. It'll be moving on a, it'll be moving on a horizontal plane. So that makes the, the left knee again twist behind. It gets in, a, in its weakest position, so you'll really lost the root in both feet. And so when you get this depth in the, the hip, the ball socket joint works just like a screw. It's a ball socket, so it's rotation, so it works in a circle. So when you're rotating into this hip, you gotta realize it's, let me, get, let me draw this back here. It, that hips, it doesn't just move straight back. It's working into a circle, but it gets deep this way but it stays inclined that way and that is so important because now that hip is I'm telling you that's like a wall right there I mean that that for me I mean it's Jim uh, yep. for me uh, hip depth is trying not to get hip depth I mean it's it's more trying to keep your arms in front of your body as you turn back to keep your right hand in a position like you teach to where it's over the ball and not under the ball or you know left over to where it's it's yeah. not effective anymore if you, if you can't turn back and keep your hand over the ball then you're not going to be able to turn back and so it's like uh, uh, this is hard to explain but you explain it better than i do in your videos but when when you talk about hip depth you're really not trying to turn your hips back. You're only turning back your hips with your right hand so that it doesn't flip over and and get underneath and, and, and around to where you have to adjust to get it back in to do some kind of crazy thing to get back on on the downswing. And I'm done. Yeah, so basically though, it's, it's because it is rooting it's re, it's really tricky 
and you have to have been there. Um, you have to be there to actually understand it. And like, if I'll give you a good example of this, and there's maybe a couple of you that heard this story. Um, but we used to do a Tai Chi class. We do it two times, two times a week, and and we did it for God, did it forever. And I had guys in there that been two plus years, three plus years into the Tai Chi program that were, and it was just it was revised a little bit, but it was you know it's traditional Tai Chi because um, it's just it was pretty neat what we had, but the bottom line was there are all these movements and Tai Chi is it, it's it's very it's like golf it can be very it can be very tough because you have to learn it yourself I mean you don't care what, who's your instructor they're going to tell you you have to learn how to feel it and, if, and martial arts instructors aren't near as nice as golf instructors they'll just tell you you know go fly a kite you know if you can't do it tough luck maybe you don't have it but you know the bottom line is you do have it and you just have to go in and tap in and be patient and, and wait for it uh, and train and, and listen to yourself because yourself you'll finally if you keep listening to yourself you'll figure it out you'll get the answers that you're looking for but um, with the my story is is uh, so Wes uh, Short one of the guys I work with he's on the Champions Tour now some of you probably know who it is but he, he won on the PGA Tour in 05 and then he won last year on the Champions Tour and I worked with Wes for Oh, probably seven years going in there. We never talked about Tai Chi one time. We've done meditation, we've done kettlebells, we've done all these other things, but we never I'd never shown him one move in Tai Chi and we've got thirty plus people in this in this room. I mean the flat place was full. And he gets in there and uh, we start doing the movements. I demonstrate our kind of our set that we're going to do. We had like a ten I think it was a ten posture set that we that we kinda of ran through. And I'm watching Wes, and I just start laughing. I mean, it, 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 I laugh because he didn't, he never missed a movement. So I had players in there, and, and the higher the handicap when it came to Tai Chi, the higher they were as a handicap, the, the, it's, it, that's how bad they moved in Tai Chi. And, and the better players moved very, much better. Well, we had a tour player in there, the best one, obviously, in the room, and he moved like, he, like he'd been training it for years. His spine was always neutral. His movements were, his alignments were always perfect. His hips and his shoulders and his arms always moved at the right time to pull him around or push him or do whatever. And so I stopped the class and I just said, "Hey, show these forms." And he goes, I, "He goes, man, I don't really understand what's so what's so hard about this." And that was the and there's people in there that have been, you know, have been working their tails off. But for him, it was very easy because that's how he God moves like that. He moves like that in his golf swing. He moves efficient, he moves powerfully, and he moves in alignment. And this movement is about all those. It's about moving with power. It's about moving in rotation, but being able to stay rooted and aligned. And if you do that, um, the rooting or the, the rooting will take care of itself. It really will. If you if you learn how to rotate over the balls of the feet, and you can do it, and you move through the thoracic part of your your spine, you never have to worry about your arms. You just won't. I mean, because if you and I had a uh, there was a PJ Tour player that played on '78 and '79. He's going to join us. Uh, he's actually going to get this uh, webinar link. He's going to start joining us every two weeks. He's one of my students. Uh, great guy. And we were working there uh, on a lesson uh, yesterday, and he was like, he, and I kept telling him because he's a backswing guy. All right, so he has to hit the planes with, you know, he, and he'll tell you this, and he wants to hit that plane, and, his, and the guy hits it dead straight, but he hits it, out, he can't hit it out of the shadow anymore. And, because uh, age has kind of got him, and so, and now he's realizing it's not really just about shaft. Shaft has got him, his shaft has gotten where he can hit it straight, play golf, but now he's lost so much distance. And so, I, I taught him how to truly root. And it was, well, you could see, he was like enlightened. I mean, he, his power went up off the charts, and he was just pumped up. He knew it, like he knew, like there was, it was different. And he, and and, and what I had to tell him was, is, and Jim, had, I'm going through a long story to tell you this, but Jim was talking about kind of, uh, let me show it from here down the line, then I'll show you the difference in face on. Was Jim was talking about keeping the arms in front of you, and just and just keep that would be classified in golf instruction for the most part, with everybody keeping the arms in front of you. Well, so does Larry Dagenhart. He keeps his arms in front of him the entire time. And Larry can't hit it anywhere anymore. Um, and these are coming from words coming from his mouth, not mine. And he wasn't. He was very short compared to where he used to be when we worked together. But he was hitting these lines, so his arms were working up. But let me show you where the problem was. So 
when he was going this way, the thoracic part of the spine, which is right behind his chest here, so this part of his body, he would move his arms up the plane, but he wasn't moving, like you can see here, he's turning his entire right side here, the whole time, and he's turning it a lot. Well, Larry wasn't turning it at all. He was just lifting his arms up to the plane, but they were they were in front and they were actually on plane, but there was no thoracic rotation. All right, and so he was. So the first thing that happened here's the scenario how it played out, and it's important. And it, you may have to listen to this a few times, and I think Larry will be able to give a great description of it because he called me today and he was all pumped up about everything how it went. But what? What I taught him, I was like, Larry, if you if you take if you set up and you have the heels off your off the ground in your setup, and you turn your thoracic, you turn it, you twist around like you're gonna throw it sidearm. You can try to get the club as flat as you want, and you realize you can't do it if your heels are off the ground. You your 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 arms really can't go behind you. I mean, technically, and so because that was his biggest fear. His biggest fear was that if he turned like that, that he thought his club's going to be five feet behind him. And it would be that way if he turned on a horizontal plane because when he was set up, he wasn't in neutral posture. He was in his heels, and his pelvis was under, and his neck was forward, and he was collapsing through the spine. That's why he couldn't rotate, so he would just lift his arm. He'd get the, he knew to hit the ball straight, he had to do it with the shaft in his hand. That's the only way he could do it. But he couldn't do it with his body, so that's why he was you sacrifice and so much. I'm talking. We're not talking about a little bit of power here. We're talking about the guy had lost. I don't. Um, I'm going to say 50, 60 yards in just a few years. That's a lot of yardage. But it was because not just his setup posture, but it was the entire package. So once I taught him how to turn over the tops of his feet, don't let the heels hit the ground as a drill. And then we got him in neutral. And we got him depth. He could turn over his, he could get his thoracic to turn as much as he wanted to and his right side to turn as much as he wanted to and the arms were still, they didn't really ever change an inch from where he was when he walked in. So all he did now was hit it 50 yards further back to where he used to, he hit it to his max potential. And so there's an art to that and it can be done and it's not luck, um, it's just it, there's a process to learning about it and it, right now like the reason why I'm talking about it tonight we'll probably have several sessions moving forward trying to understand this help you understand it in videos to because I really believe that you know we, we have so much talking about the shaft and the you know the handle and the sweet spot in the middle of the shaft side of the shaft which is that's what's going to make you play good golf but if you want to rev up the engine and be able to bust it and also create a little better platform to stabilize the face through impact the side of the shaft in the face this is how you do it. And um, so I don't want you to think that you can just have your, my point is, is, and, and I'm not saying this to offend Jim or anybody like that, but you can't just have your arms in front of you and expect that you're going to, some people can do that. If I showed it to 100 people, you might have two people that said, all right, I'm gonna keep my arms in front of me and they're gonna hit it all right. But when we got hundreds of people on here, it doesn't work that way because um, they won't move through the thoracic because they still won't change the problem. If you can turn over, turn over the tops of your feet, over the balls of your feet, that's the strongest part of the foot, it's not debatable, and you have hip depth and you're inclined downward, you can turn your thoracic as much as you want to turn it. Now what will happen is if you turn your thoracic and then you're on your heels, you fall back off your heels and you lose it, you'll learn instantly that you, one, that you're having problems with mobility and the balance is just telling you, just like the story, it's telling you you don't have the mobility, but you can, you'll feel it, you'll be able to do it even if you don't have the mobility, you'll start to learn how to turn your thoracic and keep your angle tilted at the same, you know when I say tilted, so I want you to understand it visually. So when you're, tur you're able to turn this way on that plane, not with shaft plane or any of that stuff, but your angle plane of rotation is this way. And I'm not talking about like the angle of your shoulders and the angle of your hips. I'm talking about the angle of the kind of the, the middle part of your spine. And you can just look directional angle. And what that'll do is if you turn over the top of that, it'll keep you very tall. Uh, but it'll keep you rooted on incline. And, and uh, that's what Hogan did. It's whatever, it's whatever great player really does. And you have to, you don't have to do that in your backswing. 
but let me tell you, 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 you better if you're an amateur because you won't adjust. So when you slow down and you come out of it, this is non-negotiable. You have to have, you have to be rooted here. And you can see he's, in, he's increased that root and that incline. He's moved aggressively more this way now. And that's what amateurs are scared. They're going to go, oh, I'm going to hit it fat. Well, look, he's hitting a driver right there. So if anybody thinks they're going to hit it fat, try doing that with a driver. And so, um, and the way he can do that is he has that tremendous depth that we talk about this way. He has depth in his hips. He's tilted forward. And then he's got, you know, he's, he's delivering really from right there. That's where he's delivering the middle and the side of the shaft. He's going to deliver that from right there. And it'll make more sense um, when you see the follow-up video. And then I'll have training progressions on how to, um, so when you see the video, because I know this is, a re this is probably the most technical lesson that we've had on here. Um, but I really think it's super important. And I think you can play great golf not having it. Uh, I think play good golf not having it. I think you'll play way better regardless who you are and you'll have better chance of, of saving your back, your knees, and some of those other, your neck, some of those other areas uh, for injury prevention. But more importantly, even in all that, you're just going to play better. If you understand it and you train it, you'll get, it's weird, it's just like, a, it's a muscle. They'll just get stronger and stronger and they'll want to move that way every day because you're going to know the strongest uh, it is, they are kind of positions or rotational position or movements, but you're going to learn those. how every time you move it just gets stronger and more torqued up and more torqued up and how to use that. And uh, like I said, it's really difficult to explain. <laughs> I could go on all night trying to talk about it, best, but I mean, it'll make way more sense when I demonstrate it because I'll give you a series of progressions and drills. Then you just have to, I'm going to tell you the feels to look for in the cues and then you just have to kind of play that cat and mouse game until you can do it. And then when you do it, I think everybody in two weeks will be uh, extremely excited uh, of where they're headed with, with that, because they can do it. Um, I, like I said, I, I, don't, I can't get any of the, the questions on here, but if you, if you guys can just help me out, that'd be great. But I am glad that the uh, that the arms being in front got brought up because it you know you do kind of want that but like it's uh, it gave me a chance to explain it and it'll put it'll give me a chance to put it in the follow up video. Uh, man, hey, this is John from North Carolina. I did have a question about sure. uh, when his club is at the top of the swing, the plane from his hand to the shoulder to the ground is very steep. It doesn't appear to be on the swing plane. How does he, how does he get it back on the, on the plane? Well, in our, so there's really not a plane. I mean, there's just really not. There's a million different ways to attack from. And in the earlier webinars, we, we did a, a webinar over variable planes. But uh, I'll show you as he sets up here. Um, we'll have this. But he hits, he definitely hits the planes, like the central planes that a great player would hit. There's the first one. So if you look, he lays, the first one is the seam of the shirt right here that we talk about. And if you watch that, the, the plane videos that we have on the website, and if you haven't, I would certainly uh, recommend you to watching those. And it may even be a public video. But first he hits that one right off the seam. So when he starts down, that's coming out of transition. You can see he lays the whole shaft, the face, literally everything on that. Uh, on that plane. If you look here, here's the secondary. This is the this is the, the the neutral plane. That's I mean that's literally is absolutely 100% perfect. All right. So that's through the middle of the spine, and that's if you said now there not every player does this, but the mass majority, all your great ball strikers when they start down, your great ones will will start down and hit that early. Um, there's some that will start out, that will come down steeper than this and kind of save it later, but they're not that highest level like he is. I mean, this is, we're talking about a freak ball striker. So then for us, he hits plane and plane, and then we only have one more, and that's the baseline plane. And the baseline plane would be, right, that actually hit it perfect. So the baseline plane is right here, 
And so I'm going to take a picture where his lead hand is, and I'm going to draw a straight line. And he should have, for a draw, he's going to have this about before it releases under away from the hand, which is his next frame. We'll, we'll do that. Um, the, this is perfect to hit just a little push draw. If he, it was already in this, the club head was up above his wrist, so if the wrist were still cocked just slightly, and the club head was already out, the club head was over here before it's released down, okay, then what would happen, that would be a cut. So you could have the head, if the head was, uh, you can't say exactly, but if it was just a, just slightly here to the behind, that would be a straight ball. Right here is going to be about a, you know, a three yard push draw. If he had it, he could still have it on the outside of the part of the plane same body positions and it's just going to be a little um, kind of a little pull fade and uh, so he hits all three planes for what we're taught for what we do um, and and I've been teaching that for um, you know that move for uh, the east, the east. and again when I say variable planes it is because there's guys that come in from under the hip like Sergio there's guys like Mickelson that came in where where he is you know starting down here where he's mashed up the plane, you know, you would see somebody like Mickelson that, that has the club vertical here, and then you have to start changing. He gets the side of the shaft square at the time and contact point to the grip alignment point, but it's a hell of a lot more work, and he has to compensate with his body. You know, that when you get it on through the, through the trunk of the body, so you get it through the thoracic part of the spine as the club's coming down, um, you have more, it doesn't mean you're going to be a great player, it just means you, the odds on you being a really good player go, go in your favor. But hopefully that'll help you understand the, uh, the variable plane. But there's, the thing about variable, the plane is, I mean, you, I think players hear me talk about a, a lot, is like, I talk about getting that club in this area constantly. I mean, that's where I, on all my videos you watch, I'm going to be delivering it from right here, every single video. Um, I'm not going to deliver, uh, it's one because it's kind of who I am, it's how I do it, but it's also more efficient. You, you can, the good thing about playing is you can have it under that or above that and still be a great player. Because there's still, like I said, there's other things. You, you Delivering the side of the shaft uh, and all the little wedge shots that we do to build that awareness um, will help you, you know, will help you learn how to do that. And that's why we hit so many little shots is to teach you how to build alignment for your big frame swing and um, because it's got to be natural when you start trying to line the club up through impact and trying to make it perfect and you're just training that only you're just might as well um, save your headaches now you know and not you better you're better off to actually not train at all you know but not, not do anything because it'd be better than trying to train like that where you just go out and hit buckets of balls hitting seven irons and drivers full speed trying to hold it off one shot roll it one shot hold you know this and that and so forth you know it's really designed the way this program is built is designed to get your hands in the solo club to uh, become automatic and, and just 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 how you move and that's first and foremost because that's your true timing and then you build all this other stuff like we're doing here like the frame of the swing but it's also the motion within the frame then that's like the horsepower because the hands have to be automatic and the frame and the motion can play a part in that because if the frame's breaking down and the motion's breaking down, the hands are going to start to be affected unless you're at a, such a high level that you can withstand it, which, you know, most players aren't going to be that here. Um, you know, you can about put any, you, he could hit off his back foot right here and still play good golf I and mean, he still shoot par golf. He could hit off his front foot and play par golf because he's got control of the number one thing. He's got you know, control of the, the sole of the club and the and the and the and the hands. He knows what he's doing with the club. So and that program, our program will always be based off of that, and always be you've got to become a master with that short shot and uh, ten yards, twenty yards, thirty yards, not putting one before the other, just do it in that order, and and really truly becoming a master of those shots. So when you build your frame, that that now you've already built your hands, so now you're putting this all this power and momentum behind it, and your hands are already just you know, because if you on the if you've watched my videos, I've shown it. It's like you hit the, your hand action for a 10 yard uh, chip and run is the same as it is for a 300 yard drive. Your hand action is the same. Your clip face to shaft to everything relationship is exactly the same. There's no difference. It's just more speed and torque and unleashing on it, but that's why it's got to be automatic. 
So if you can master that and get your hands in that, those alignments built, then uh, you can start to put the uh, frame on top of it and the motion and unleash on it. Um, any more questions? Okay. And feel free, whoever's on here, to fire away if there's chat questions on here, because I can't, like I said, for some reason I'm not allowed to, to look at them. I'll try again, but I don't think I'll be able to. Okay. Hey, I just wanted to add something, uh, Matt. Sure. Uh, for the gang here, Matt and I worked on that incline and rooting a couple weeks ago, and I had to go out and play the next morning, and I was trying to do the pause and the, the incline and root, but it's so much different than the way I normally swing. I, I really kind of wasn't expecting much. I thought it was going to be kind of a throwaway round, but I was willing to give it a try. And for nine holes, I couldn't believe how well I played. I mean. It was just amazing. I, I shot even par, and I'm a guy who never broke 80, so for nine holes. Then I got kind of out of my comfort zone and got a little overexcited and struggled a little more on the back, and I still shot 79. But, but uh, boy, I, I couldn't believe how well that works if you can if you can do it. <laughs> but, uh, I, but I know I can do it now. It's just going to take a little more work. So. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, Mike, uh, Thanks for sharing that, because uh, I was going to bring it up tonight, and I just I forget once I kind of get into my feel. And, and I know that lesson, we, you had kind of a, uh, you had a live lesson that morning, and then you had the webinar that night before you shot the 79. And that, that live lesson that we had is, you know, I, I, I'm speaking for me, but, you know, it was a tough lesson. You know, I was having you really, you know, I was having you really work at it and really, um, I was pushing it and really trying to get you to, to, to do it and you were having a hard time with it at first and then you started to figure it out you could start telling you were starting to adjust and move your body and transition and you're slowing down the club and then by the time we finished you know you started to understand that you could I could still see the doubt you know because everybody you like you 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 said um, actually it perfect on that lesson you said I feel like I'm gonna hit it fat and everybody feels like they're gonna hit it fat because you're loaded so inclined um, if I put if I put somebody in this um, position that he's in right here, I wouldn't even have to do it with the driver. If I put him down that in, put him that inclined to the ball, they're gonna feel, and they probably will hit it fast because they don't know how to move through the grip alignment point. But they're gonna feel like they can't. They're gonna whiff. They're gonna feel that way because they're they're not used to being on an incline rooted in, on an incline plane. And and like you said, you felt that, but then all of a sudden. You know, you went out and you, you know, you played your best golf of your life that day and uh, the next day, and it was probably the most technical session that we've had. And I think we've done four, I think four sessions, something like that. But at that time, I think it was only the second one or third one. I'm not sure. But yeah, third one, I think. Third one, yeah. And uh, it just to speed the process up, and and I think that's what's good about the live training program. That if um, you know, it's the winter time, and and I know there's a lot of players on here that are in it, and there's there's several players that aren't, but um, I, I, it does speed up this process. I will say that. I always, and, and Mike will tell you. I always tell everybody: look, study the website. I don't. I don't want you to become dependent on this live training stuff and all that. I want you to be dependent on um, on 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 learning the pattern you need, learning how you need to move. And I think that's where live training comes in really handy. And then using the site and your iPad and your and your training devices and video to study and. and and learn your specific movements, but then also the stuff that can also help you within the site. Because there really is, there's a lot of stuff that can, that can help you on there. It's amazing if you get into all of it. Just, just, if you just do kettlebells, tai chi, and some of the mental training with the, with the swing stuff, it'll just make everything. There's a reason why it's on there. It's not to look good, it's just because it works. Um, All right, uh, anybody else, any questions? Like I said, feel free if you see a question to, to let me know if there's one up here that it hasn't been answered, but if there's not, then we'll, we'll go ahead and start to wrap it up. All right, so um, what I'll do is I'll look at the questions. There weren't, there weren't too many questions tonight, but there were some good, there were some different questions, which is always good, uh, different topics, so it'd be good to have all that, um, to be able to, to answer that. But 
I'll make a video on uh, rooting the feet. And I haven't made a video before on rooting the feet because it's so difficult to do it. Um, but I've, I've got a I've got a plan in there to uh, to help you out. And so anyway, uh, thanks for staying on here and, and hearing what we have to say and, and look forward to, and to making you better over the winter because it is an opportunity for all of us to get you better. You guys have a great night, okay? Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you. Have a great night.